Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's installment of our Global Perspectives Speaker Series. My name is Mark Wynn. I'm a Vice President in the International Group here at the Dallas Fed and a Director of the Bank's Globalization Institute, which organizes these events. Our guest this evening is John Taylor, who is currently the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University, and also the George P. Schultz Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. John is one of the most distinguished monetary economists of his generation and is the author of the famous Taylor Rule, which is widely used to guide and evaluate central bank performance. His public service includes terms on the President's Council of Economic Advisors as a senior economist in 1976-77 and as a member in 1989-91. He also served as Under Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs between 2001 and 2005. Indeed, it was in this capacity that I believe John first visited the Dallas Fed to speak at a conference on sovereign debt that Carlos Zarazaga and I organized in 2003. John is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Alexander Hamilton Award and the Treasury Distinguished Service Award at the US Treasury, the Medal of the Republic of Uruguay for his work on resolving the 2002 financial crisis, the Truman Medal for Economic Policy for Extraordinary Policy Contributions, and the Bradley Prize for Economic Research and Policy Achievements. He was also awarded the Hayek Prize for his book, First Principles, and Adam Smith Awards from the National Association for Business Economics and the Associ Association for Private Enterprise Education. John will participate in a moderated conversation with Rob Kaplan, who is the current president and CEO of the Dallas Fed. Before joining the Fed, Rob was a professor and senior associate dean at the Harvard Business School, which he joined after a long business career at Goldman Sachs. We will be taking audience questions during the event, and we'd love to hear from you. If you would like to ask the speakers a live question, please click the raise hand icon on the bottom of the control bar to enter the queue. If you would prefer to submit a written question, use the Q&A button on the bottom of the control bar to submit your question. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible and also try to address questions in the order in which they are received. We apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Rob. Rob? Thank you, Mark. And it's great to have everybody here. And it's particularly great to have John Taylor at the Dallas Fed. Uh, John has been a great friend and a coach and mentor to me, but he's been a longtime friend of the Dallas Fed. And so uh, it's a real honor to have you here. Uh, and for those in the audience, Mark Wynn alluded to this, but John is one of the, uh, the giants of the economics field and the monetary policy field. And so we're, 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 we're thrilled to, to have a great relationship with him and to have him here. And so John, uh, I'm gonna start just to give a little bit of, of uh, for those who don't know you, a little bit of your background. You uh, went to Princeton, got your PhD at Stanford, and, uh, and then you went on uh, to be professor at Columbia, Princeton, and then you've been a longtime professor at Stanford starting in 84. What made you become an economist? Well, I made you, thank, and by the way, Rob, this is terrific. Thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be back in Dallas, so to speak. I, uh, I got interested in economics as an undergraduate. Uh, I was originally interested in kind of math and physics, but uh, took an economics course and just kind of loved what was going on, so applying these techniques to, to ideas which I think were important. And uh, did a, uh, a senior thesis with some talented people uh, who got me thinking about models and uh, stochastic processes and uh, dynamics. and. Believe it or not, I started working on policy rules back then. It's, it's, it's believe it or not, 53 years ago. And uh, read my first policy rules, uh, they were not the most sophisticated, but it was the beginning. And I liked the idea of, of thinking about policy as a system, as a strategy, and it just was appealing to me. Basically, I think because of the models that people uh, showed me at the time. And over the years, you've had uh, a lot of folks from the Fed have been your students and you've mentored many people uh, who've gone into central banking around the world. Have you always liked teaching students and mentoring and coaching people? Oh yeah, no, I, I like teaching um, at all levels. Uh, maybe the most rewarding is at the PhD level, they're thinking about new ideas and as you mentioned, have very talented students over time. But I think it's it's at all levels. In fact, one of the one of the I've gone back and forth uh, from public policy to, to academia quite a few times, 
including one which was not quite mentioned as the military. I was served in the military and I was in the middle of graduate school and then came back. But each time you had a sense of uh, applying real world things to, for students. And that challenge I think has always been one which fascinated me. How do you tell students about fiscal policy or monetary policy or, or international strategy and how do you explain it? And students uh, are a big part of my life. So you, you alluded to this, but your first um, uh, time going into uh, the government was in, you had two stints at the Council of Economic Advisors, one from 76 and 77, and then once from uh, 1989 to 1991. Uh, did you always know you wanted to do public service and how did you uh, come to go to the Council of Economic Advisors? No, I didn't know it. I, I did know the idea of applying, I wanted to ap apply things and, uh, yeah. As you know very well, applying things, if you're involved in it, in some sense, is an advantage. So I had an opportunity. Uh, I was a professor at Columbia. Phil Kagan was a colleague, and he knew people like uh, Alan Greenspan and, and others. And so if a calls, hey, Taylor might be interested. And so uh, I went and did it. And I was the first, which uh, was in the uh, Ford administration. Alan Greenspan was the chair, and then we stayed on. Uh, Carter, Carter administration, there was a turnover, but that in itself was a fascinating thing to see how the politics changed. The economics didn't change as much as the politics. It's always something to keep in mind. But I, I learned a lot about um, what was what was applicable. What what could you actually bring from the from the public policy arena and make it useful in to study and to, and then come back again. That back and forth, I think, is is usually important in terms of finding ideas that are, you know, there's so many ideas we could work on. Those help focus on what the important ideas are. So your second stint at the CEA was 1991, and then you went back to Stanford and resumed uh, being a professor. And it was during that time, before your next stint in the government, you came up with the Taylor Rule. Uh, and for those in the audience, some are familiar with this, but and Mark Wynn alluded to it, uh, probably in, in, before every FOMC meeting, uh, we go through a calculation here uh, with our team at the Dallas Fed, and I bet a lot of uh, Fed presidents do the same thing, where we look at the original Taylor rule and we look at derivations of the Taylor rule. And it basically, uh, well, I'll let you explain it. What made you come up with the Taylor rule and, uh, and uh, what, what was the genesis of it? So it actually goes back a long time. I have to say, the models that I used were models, they were dynamic. They changed over time. It wasn't a static thing. Sometimes you teach students something, the supply and demand is, is stationary, but this was moving. And so you had to have a strategy or a, or a rule to deal with it. So it goes way back uh, 50 years. But then was what is the best way to do this? You know, Milton Friedman was talking about money growth rules and there were alternatives. But, but what struck me as more most suitable and most realistic and most useful was a rule where the interest rate was the instrument. And so then you had to think, well, what are the key factors? And so huge numbers of, of model simulations, experiments, what's realistic, and came up with this idea that, well, we can make it pretty simple if the interest rate rises by a certain amount when inflation rises and it uh, declines by a certain amount when the economy is in a recession. And hey, to make it simple, let's leave everything else out. Obviously everything is, is can't be left out completely, but that that was a simple thing. And uh, it, it, uh, it caught people's eyes and imagination very quickly. So I was, I was pleased by that. And that caused a lot of discussion and what's wrong with it or what's good about it. Uh, how does it apply to other countries, which was, which was quite a surprise because I wasn't thinking about other countries at the time. So for, for those in the audience, every six weeks, uh, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee meets. And a lot of the publicity is about a number of things we do, but one of them, how do we, do we increase, decrease, or keep the same, the Fed funds rate? And this rule that John is describing is, uh, is a guide uh, based on the level of inflation and whether it's high or low versus target and the out, so-called output gap, if we're weaker or stronger in the economy. And that helps. It's a reality check for practitioners like, like me. Now, back when you first did it, the, the neutral rate, the kind of the equilibrium interest rate was much higher than it is today. And we can go into later why that is. Have you adapted that rule in the years that followed? 
Well, it wasn't easy to decide what the right rate should be back then. You know, no, no one had done this before. So I chose uh, 2% real. It was based on some history and some thinking, but it, and it was pretty close. And also a target inflation rate of two, which was, was long before the Fed had two out there, but uh, people had begun to talk about it. So, so two real plus two inflation gave you a nominal of four. And that's how it was originally, which, you know, interest rates were higher than that coming into it. We were still getting rid of inflation. But uh, that, that seemed to be to work pretty well. And then your question is how that changed over time. Well, it, it's pretty simple in a way. You just change the two to one and a half or to one, and everything else is the same. Uh, you know, why, why change the degree to which the interest rate should change when inflation changes just because the normal rate is lower? So that's how I've always struck this issue. And quite frankly, the, the 2% was, you know, was not rocket science in the first place. So the, then the, you know, people came up and questioned it. I think probably I was more resistant than I deserved to be, but uh, there's some value to having a number that people can remember and, and, and that it comes from some analysis of some kind. All right, and we're gonna we're gonna come back to that in a moment. You then did a stint at the Treasury, you were Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs for four years. How different? And that was a much broader experience than just economics. You dealt with a lot of things. How different experience was that? It was much different. Uh, for one thing, 9/11 uh, happened soon after I got there, and so that changed everything. You know, you're we I was traveling to Iraq and Afghanistan, trying to get people together for this very unusual activity, which we had to engage in many, many meetings in the situation room, hundreds of meetings in the situation room. I think it was uh, the idea for me looking back on it was to bring some economics into our foreign policy, which frequently gets forgotten, it still gets forgotten, but we had the defense, we had the diplomacy at the State Department, but the economics were, I think, a big part of everything we did. And so that was to me a, a big part of what I was doing. I think we were, we were pretty successful. We you know, had a, a terrible damage. Uh, I was in Japan when 9-11 happened. I remember coming back to the US uh, on a huge military plane. The skies were vacant, nobody was there. And we had to sort of get, get going at the time. It was really starting from scratch. And I, I think the Fed did a good job at that point. Alan Greenspan was still the chair. And, uh, but, but it was really quite a remarkable experience. And then after that, of course, you know, what do you do next? And there were some international reforms on the development side. I think we needed to do more for, uh, for poor countries and we tried to do more of that. So it was a multifaceted job, the inter international job of the church. One of the best jobs I've ever had, quite frankly. And the time, maybe the time made a difference to it. So, so rolling forward, uh, we had the financial crisis, obviously the Great Recession in, uh, in the height of it, 08 and 09. I think it, it, you have frequently cited, and this comes back to the Taylor rule, that maybe the Fed left rates too low for too long. And it was one of the causes of the global financial crisis. And, and, and you might just talk about what, are, what were the risks of, of keeping rates too low for too long and how, that, how might that have led to that crisis? Well, the, the Taylor rule in more general ways to think about it, did suggest rates were quite low uh, in the period before the financial crisis. And I think to some extent that, you know, people at the Fed knew that they were saying, well, we, we need to be extra low. There's a danger of deflation like Japan. We can't be Japan. So I think there was a purposeful risk taking, if you like, it, 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 where the rate was lower. And so that worried me at the time because the evidence was that this, this rule had worked pretty well, actually. It was one of the reasons why the, we had this uh, great moderation in, in the economy. It was very good. And so it began to worry me, and I wrote about it in advance of the crisis. This was dangerous. And what happened is the, the low, low rate causes a search for yield. It causes too much risk taking. And of course, there was a lot of that, right. a, lot of, a lot of overextension in the financial sector. And then when it eventually crashed, it was a big crash. So I, I think it, uh, the lesson there was very clear. It wasn't that something that many people wanted to hear at the time, but uh, I think it was important to get out there. And, and, and in retrospect, it was, I think, a very, very important aspect of 
what we did wrong. And I, I hope that I hoped at the time that that wouldn't happen again. So but anyway, that was it was an example where basic economics uh, is simplified, of course, by a rule. But you, there's many other ways to look at it. Uh, suggested that uh, we were taking some extra risks at the time, uh, even though people in charge thought that wasn't the case. So roll forward from the crisis. One of the reforms in the aftermath of the crisis was much tougher capital requirements, stress testing for the banks, uh, because the big problem in the crisis obviously was risk-taking leverage at the banks. Uh, did the reforms... Um, did the reforms with the banking system, did you, do you think they went far enough? Did they do enough to help mitigate some of the risks you were worried about from keeping rates for too long, too low for too long? No, I think they basically went in the, in the right direction. And of course, the debate about the rates was always there, but it wasn't just the rates. You know, at that point, there were serious problems in the, in the financial system. I had hoped at the time there would be some reform of the bankruptcy code too. That never took place. It was quite close. There was a lot of interest in that uh, so that you wouldn't have the bailout. You wouldn't have the problem of bailouts, which was still there, of course, and there's lots of debate about it. But that was one thing I wish there had been more uh, at the time that had been done. Is this because you're worried it encouraged risk taking? Yeah, yes, it was. And also a risk of the government. I mean, there's another aspect of which the government would have to bail out if the if the situation got very dire, but if you had a, a a resolution process, which is what we proposed, the creditors yeah. would work it out, and you wouldn't have to have a big bailout from the government. So you, the creditors would work it out in in a way which was is actually not that uncommon in many other situations, but it would even apply to large firms, and I think that you know when things got very tough. It was hard to make those decisions at the Fed and elsewhere about the bailouts. And we right. wanted to take that difficulty away so there'd be a more, it's actually more rule-like, more systematic approach to how you would handle future situations like that. So let's roll forward. It took us uh, eight or nine years, but before it not, wasn't until 2015, we finally increased rates. I know for those first couple of three years, when you look at the Taylor rule, and I, I know you you felt we probably should have gotten a move on a little faster than we did, but I think we eventually caught up or started to catch up to where maybe yeah. you thought rates should appropriately be. And then, then going into this year, we've got the COVID situation uh, and, and obviously the extraordinary actions. Of, what would be your critique or your assessment of how the Fed has done, what we've done well, and maybe we need to be worried about in our response to COVID? Well, I think it was the quick response was good and the actions taken were good. And at the time, no, no one knew exactly what was happening. I think there was some problems in the financial markets not working, markets are effectively closed. So this opened them and created more action in the markets. Uh, the, the Fed provided that. So I think that was that was good. And it's, I would say, if you're asking for a critique, it's really where we go from here. And maybe it's time to stipulate a little bit more about what's next. There's still a lot of purchases that are going on. Uh, we don't know how long the rate will be near zero. Uh, so I, I would say it, it's time to, to go back to a rule. It, it's time okay. to describe what, what's happening. I think there is work, work going on that. Uh, I wish there were a little more. I'd say one other thing which I uh, didn't think need to happen for starting in 2017, as you know, they, it was part of the um, annual monetary report, which included a whole section on policy rules and that the Taylor rule and modifications of it and various things. And I think uh, Jay Powell as chair began to talk about policy compared to that. It, it began with Janet Yellen, but I think uh, that was very promising. I wrote a lot about it, but then it just disappeared. It just disappeared uh, in the latest one. I hope it comes back, but it's an indication. Well, you know, we've got other things to worry about now, which right. you do. But right. I, think, I think focusing on this on the strategy going forward would be beneficial. Doesn't mean you go there right away, but you have a sense of where things will go. Very important. So we have this conversation a lot, and you and I have talked about this a lot. So what's the what's the problem if we're too accommodative? or too accommodative for too long. What's, 
so what? You know, uh, I wouldn't say so what, but maybe some people say so what. It doesn't doesn't feel you know uh, like a bad thing. Uh, what's what's the risk? Well, the the risk that people refer to, which is not really there much now, is inflation. Inflation will come if you don't eventually right. uh, adjust, and uh, that doesn't mean right now, but it means later next year, the year after. But I think more important now is that the extra uh, search for yield that occurs, the extra risk taking, the confusion in financial markets about what the what the interest rate is, what's determining the interest rate, what's the role of the Fed in, in affecting the interest rate. So those, those cause uncertainty. It'd be better, I think experience shows it better if the market was, was there more than it is now when there's such an intervention by the Fed. So I think that you know experience has shown, and it goes back a long time, that when you deviate from a strategy or rule, and there's you know some bad times, and George Schultz and I just finished a book re- re- reminding people of what happened in the 70s, which there was no sense of, uh, of a rule or strategy, and uh, your predecessors got off track big time. But then you know Volcker came in and, and changed things, and it got back to a I think a more reasonable policy and it worked pretty well. Uh, and uh, and so that's that's one experience. You have other countries, it's the same kind of thing. And you know, it just makes sense to have a sense of where we're going, what the strategy is, what's the rule. I, sometimes I say, it's good to have a target for inflation. It's good to have some notion of what unemployment is, but the strategy is maybe more important than both. You know, if you don't have a sense of what you do with the interest rate, say, or even purchases in response, you're not really describing what the policy is very much. And it's just, again, this goes back many, many years for me. If you have a dynamic economy, which is moving over time, especially in this international world, where there's many, many central banks, you're, you're much better off describing as close as you can that what the strategy is, rather than just decide uh, on the fly. Okay. And that means strategy in this case means what under what conditions, what types of actions would you take under various different uh, economic conditions? Yes. yes. And it doesn't have to be as, as precise. I think that's one thing which um, people have trouble with, you know, how precise does it have to be? And I think it doesn't have to be as precise as people uh, sometimes think it. The the so-called Taylor rule is a mathematical formula. You can write it down, you can look at it, you can debate it. Actually, that's one of the attractive features. Just in, you know, there's been work at the board and elsewhere um, using models with rules in them. They do it all the time. Right. And so that's good. You can evaluate. It doesn't mean that the policy has to be exactly like that. And there are there are other issues that come into play. All right. But I think it's, it's a sense, it's like any kind of strategy, uh, whether it's foreign policy or, or uh, regulatory strategy, you can describe what, what it is uh, and you can use a mathematical formula to help you debate what's right or not, but it doesn't have to be that precise. All right, I'm gonna squeeze in two or three questions before we go to the audience. Let me ask you, so we just talked about monetary policy and a lot of people say, gee, you talk, there are rules for monetary policy. Maybe there should be rules for fiscal policy you know, we have debt now approaching 100 percent, debt held by the public, 100 percent of GDP, present value and fund entitlements, present value of unfunded entitlements, 65 trillion. How worried are you about growth in the debt? And wh- wh- how, how should we be thinking about the growth in the debt from here? Well, I, I am worried going forward. And I think if there is an, a third package, part of that should be what happens afterwards. You know, there's all the discussion of this year and next year, but where we're going in the future, which is what you're asking about, is is so important. And so, I did some uh, some research with uh, Danny Hill and John Cogan. We actually took some models and simulated some ways to keep the growth of spending from being so rapid going forward. And uh, the budget deficit is much lower as a result going forward. Doesn't not much difference right now. And that then that's a sense of a better economy. The, the growth is higher. Uh, according to this fairly reasonable model, growth is higher. If we manage the debt growth more effectively. Yes, exactly. It's, it, w- it, work, it works better. And uh, I think that's that's a lesson we've been learning over time. There's big debate about it now, of course, as you know, the deficits don't matter, it's out there all the time. 
Right. But I think they, they do. And it doesn't mean you don't have a deficit and a terrible recession. You, you, it was always this notion of a, a rule, as you say, deficits rise in recessions and they go uh, the other way in booms. That actually represents a pretty good fiscal policy. And I think if we aim towards that going forward, we'll be better off. It's, it's not easy. So people have talked about ways to get there. One is entitlement reform, maybe entitlement reform, spending uh, cuts, more revenues, which is a sensitive topic, obviously. And then the other thing is growing faster, finding ways to grow the workforce, improve productivity. Which, what, did you, what did you look at in your paper or what are your thoughts on how we ought to go about this? We tried to make it simple, just look at the growth of entitlement spending. Uh, so leave... Uh, military aside for the most part, discretionary spending aside. So right now there's a growth of entitlement spending, which is much more than GDP. If you bring that down, and I think in ways that are quite reasonable given the, the demographic situation, that's all that's required, quite frankly. Wow. It's, it's quite surprising to many people. Wow. That's all you need. And okay. uh, now it's, and, and you do get higher growth. And I think that's a benefit. I would like to see policies that, that aim towards higher growth, and that is regulatory reform, yep. uh, tax reform, uh, things that stimulate investment, stimulate in innovation, uh, stimulate new ideas, and it's a, it's a huge good time to do that. Um, right now, in fact, I think we're seeing so much innovation from the private sector that's because of, of this terrible disease that we're facing, and we don't want to we don't want to discourage that. And there's a tendency to go the other way, as you know, with the government as a solution, where frequently it's not, there's other ways to deal with it. And, and uh, that's, that's the productivity side, that's the growth side. It's a, it's a separate but very important issue compared to what we looked at. All right, so let me, let me talk to you about uh, inflation and the Fed's new framework, which, you, which we've talked a lot about. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll start with, before I get to the framework, do you, do you have a theory? We, we work here at the Dallas Fed on a theory, as you, as you know, that technology, technology-enabled disruption may be having a more muting effect on pricing power than we've realized, but, but we're still working on, uh, but that's our working theory here. Having said that, do you have a sense on why, even at very low rates of unemployment, we've seen more muted inflation over the last 10 years? I think that's... Uh... It's because of the, the things you mentioned, quite frankly. It's uh, different technology, different innovation, which is putting downward pressure on prices. And uh, I think that's what's going on. I wouldn't say it's completely out of line. Uh, people saying, oh, it's the old equations don't work. I think they, they work just fine. They're, you know, they've never been rocket science. Uh, you didn't have to, didn't want to rely on that for things like a Taylor rule, that's for sure. But I think they're they still have a message, and you shouldn't worry about you should worry about them. But in the meantime, you do have this: uh, what's the right inflation target for the Fed? And that's what you've been working on. I I tend to say, look, uh, let's not go let's not go high, let's not go to four or five or something like that. Uh, the two is not so bad, and uh, I've been somewhat critical of the uh, the average inflation targeting. Um, I think here, here's where it would be very useful to have some description of what happens next. And I, uh, one of, uh, one of uh, your colleagues in Texas, David Papel, has been working on ways to think about the decisions that you and your colleagues have made in the context of a rule or a yeah, strategy. I just read his paper. Yeah, okay. So I think it's a, a very healthy way, a good way to think about this. And it, he shows it's, it's, it works quite well. And so that's the way you translate in what you've done or what you're going to do, but it's more flexible. If the economy does come back, come out of it, like some people are forecasting, rates will be higher as a result. Or if inflation picks up, rates right. will be higher as a result or, or vice versa. What, what should the Fed do if it turns out that this structural driver of technology, technology-enabled disruption makes it so that uh, we're unable to reach the 2% target or average 2%. How far should the Fed, what should the Fed do? Should we, how far should we go? Or should we try to keep a balanced approach where inflation isn't the be all end all and we weight it against how tight, uh, how low we can get unemployment? I think it's important to keep inflation there as a, 
is, is something that you're focusing on. Uh, it's been good that unemployment has been low until this terrible crisis. Uh, but I think that represents better policy. You know, the, the rates started to rise in uh, 2016, 17, 18, 19 even. And that represented getting back to a normal policy. I was very positive about that. I think it extended the expansion beyond what most people thought at the time. And, 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 and it did affect unemployment in a very healthy way. So that, that seemed to be representing good policy. Good, 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 interest rates were rising. Right. Know, interest rates were rising during that period and capital was being allocated, I think, more efficiently. And then, of course, things changed and now we're trying to figure out what to do now and where we go forward. Right. And I, I think the history is that it's it, these rules, and if you want to have, instead of 2% real, 1.5% or 1%, that's fine. I think you want to make sure the analysis is, is solid and clear and different people have different views about that. But I think that's the way to do it. You have this, you have this overall strategy, but there's things that change. Maybe the, the full employment unemployment rate has changed. Maybe the uh, equilibrium real interest rate, to te- use a technical word, has changed. Right. Bring those into account. And I think we'll, I think we'll be fine. So uh, there's an argument going on, some of it public, as you know. Uh, you've heard some of it at your conference the last couple of weeks, where uh, some people believe uh, if you if you start getting down again to three three and a half percent unemployment, and you still are struggling to meet your inflation target, despite the rule, you should start raising rates. And others would say no, we should really keep the rate where it is until we've actually you know gotten to two percent. Where do you come out on that debate? Well, I think you've got two factors. You got the inflation rate, you got the unemployment rate, and both are, have to be measured. And uh, both are subject to problems of what the normal value is, especially unemployment. Yeah. And there may be some something in the labor force that's making unemployment lower than otherwise would. And so you want to take that into account. Yeah. There was a while there where people said that the natural rate is 6%. Right. You know, maybe it's better, maybe three and a half is four is better and four used to be it. So I think the research should be focusing on determining what that level is best as possible. You don't know. And then, and then working that out uh, with a, a rule or strategy, same with the inflation rate. Uh, you have uh, low, low inflation rate might be lower than otherwise because of the technological things that you're mentioning. We'll I'll take that into account. And uh and I think we should be fine, but there's always a trade-off, right? The world has this trade-off yep. and not to even mention the international side of this trade-off. We're just talking right. about domestically, but international, there's another, another aspect of this too. And I've written a lot about how I think maybe central banks have paid too much attention to the exchange rate and that's gotten them, gotten them off and, and caused a relationship between the decisions, which is basically harmful. So that's another factor, which, uh, I'd watch for if if, uh, I were you. Okay, good. All right. I appreciate that. All right. Let's turn to Mark. Let's take some questions from the audience. Okay. um, First question that came in. uh, Since the Fed is now clearly involved with monetizing the debt and will be for some time, is the Fed currently behind the times and not moving quickly enough into its own dollar-based digital currency, which can be both currency and debt itself at the same time, such as Ethereum? Is it not extremely important for the Fed, which is now effectively the world's central bank, to be the first to market with this technology? So I think the, the Fed has been a little slower uh, to look at the digital currency than certainly, the, you know, it started with the private sector. Uh, Basic, for example, was early firm. Um, and then certain central banks started to work on it. The Chinese are doing quite a bit. Um, I think it's a good thing for, for central banks to be looking at. Um, it doesn't mean they're giving up on, we're not giving up on the dollar, but there may be better ways to deal with it. So it's a very important technology. I'm interested in myself. Uh, it may have some implications for central banks and other parts of the world, but I would, I would, I would spend some time thinking about that, having the best people around uh, talking about it. It's, it's, uh, you might go in a different direction, but it's, it's happening anyway. And so I would, I would agree that we need to be looking on that. And can I ask one follow-up on that? Um, so we're talking about the digital currency. How does all this affect uh, the dollar as the world's reserve currency? 
And what is your what are your thoughts about the sustainability of the dollar as the world's reserve currency? Well, if it's an alternative to the dollar, then it affects uh, the dollar as a currency. And I, at this point, I think there's the 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 dollar being out there is important. Um, I, I think it provides some stability. It's probably not gonna be there forever. Just reality, there's other things that are going on, but I think it's, it's an important aspect of US policy. Uh, but I think other countries, uh, are, it's not gonna work for everybody. And you, you, know, you had the Euro forum not that long ago. You have questions in Africa and small open economies, what they're doing. So I think it's, it's something which um, most likely will reduce the importance of the dollar. Uh, and that's one reason why the Fed, I think, should be working on it. How worried are you about the dollar not being the world reserve currency and causing the U.S. having to pay a lot more to, uh, for its debt with this amount of debt we built up? Well, it's not clear that they're related, right? You could have the, the dollar be less important uh, globally, but have uh, interest rate lower and less debt. So yeah. it's, it doesn't go uh, hand in hand. Okay. I think there's some value to having um, the dollar out there as an important currency, an important uh, store of value. And that's that actually helps drive policy, I think, in a good direction. We're having a, a stable inflation rate, uh, 2% or 1.5%, whatever it is, is good. And this, this that's a, becomes a responsibility for global responsibility. So I think it's fine. And that's, I think, one reason why you want to be sure that uh, there's some uh, some alternative doesn't occur that just that does moves that around in a, in a sudden way which you don't anticipate. So uh, that's what I, I would think. Okay, good, thank you. Mark, next one. Okay, and just a reminder, if anybody wants to ask a question live, just click on the uh, raise hand icon. Uh, the next question that's being submitted, uh, do you think that the Fed would ever implement a negative interest rate target? Uh, how would they go about doing this practically? So I don't think so. You're probably asking the wrong person on this call, quite frankly, but I, no, think I agree with you. I agree with your answer on that. OK, um, I actually think that um, and it was so great that uh, uh, we had this conference and Robert Kaplan spoke at it a couple of couple weeks ago at uh, Stanford. But uh, last week we had someone from the UCB and they have a negative rate and uh, there's analysis to say it's fine. I don't think it worked that well. Uh, it hasn't, been, hasn't passed through as much as you'd think. So, so I would not be going in that direction, quite frankly. I think it's, uh, there are people who say that's fine, but I think the US has a large capital market, a lot of uncertainty, which we caused by that. I think it's, it's fine leaving it above zero and, and uh, that would not be a place I would go at this point. Okay, next question. In the uh, post-World War II period, the Fed pegged interest rates to keep interest rates low on the large government debt. Any lessons from that period for today? Yeah, well, we got off of that. Uh, <laughs> it took a while to get off of it. Hmm. Uh, this, uh, the Bank of Japan has done the other way now. They've targeted the longer rate. I don't think it's a good idea for us. I think that, you know, we have a, a system uh, where it's not exactly that way now, but the, the Fed controls the money supply, which controls the short-term interest rate, which through the term structure of interest rates affects the whole term structure of rates, including longer rates. I think that's worked well. If, you, if there's a specific effort to intervene at the long end, I think that is a, another, um, confusing aspect of policy. I wouldn't really want to go in that direction. Now, to some extent, uh, the, the quantitative easing has been motivated by that, right? It's not completely. Sometimes it's like the rate, oh, the rate is near zero. We have to have other means. We'll do quantitative easing means in large-scale asset purchases. But to some extent, purchasing to the longer end has been motivated by reducing the interest rates to the longer end. I think it's better if the markets are uh, or what determines the other rates. And the Fed focuses on, I think it's liquidity, uh, money demand, money supply, and therefore the, the short-term rate. I think that that's a system that's worked well in the past and it'll continue to work in the future. And, and you're worried that if there's this distortion at the longer end, what it encourage more risk-taking or will it will encourage behavior that may be uh, counterproductive? 
Yes, but in addition, what's the, who's, who's to determine what that rate is? You know, I think there's a sense in which the, the market um, will take various things into account and there may be some reasons why the rate should be higher. I, I wouldn't want the central bank to fight those forces if it was there were forces which represented lots of individual decision-making, lots of firms, lots of consumers. That seems to me you're getting in the way of something which economics would tell you works pretty well. And so, so why interfere with that? Okay. Uh, next question. Do you agree with the bailouts the US government made or do you wish that the government had let more firms fail in the fallout from the crisis? It's not clear if that's the current crisis or the last big one. Well, the, the past crisis, uh, I was, was critical of the actions and that's why I was very active to propose this uh, alternative. Uh, and uh, it was to modify the bankruptcy code so that even a large firm uh, could go into bankruptcy, meaning the creditors would have a system to uh, recover some of their debt. So uh, we didn't have such a law. And so that's one reason why the bailouts occurred. And so I, I, I think it's too bad we didn't have one put in place and there may be a, a reason to revive it now. It was very close actually in terms of passing the the, um, the Treasury under uh, President Trump looked like they were going to push it, but then things happened and there was not, it wasn't going far enough. But that's, that's what I would say, that there's lots of reasons that the bailouts, it's, it's big individual decisions, it's, it's uh, affected by forces which are hard to know which, is, which are political, which is not political. And so it's better to, to let a, the system work uh, and the bankruptcy code is part of the rule of law. And that's what I would prefer. Maybe we'll get back to that in the future. Um, and I don't know. I think, it'd be, I think we'd be better off if we did. Okay, uh, we have a, question, a live question from an audience member, Robert Potter. Robert, if you unmute yourself, uh, you can ask your question. You need to unmute. Okay, I had to go unmute. There you I'd go. like to put this question to the two of you, actually, John first, I'd like to ask your view of cryptocurrency. Do you think it will live? Do you think it will ever replace the dollar? Do you think it will ever become a reserve currency? What do you think of it? So I, I like the idea of alternative currencies. Uh, it's, it's innovation, it's ways to transfer money more rapidly. Maybe because of this disease, I haven't used paper currency in months. <laughs> and uh, there's lots of, lots of alternatives. So I, I like the thinking about it and, the, and I'd like, I wish the, the regulators were positive about it. In terms of substituting for something, uh, I, I think we'll have to wait and see how good it is. I mean, the dollar we, we discussed a few minutes ago works pretty well as a, a currency. So uh, I would say encourage work on it. Don't try to stomp it out for, uh, because of jealousy or other reasons. By the way, I think originally, even the BIS uh, was reticent to move ahead and to, to support this kind of research. I think they may be changing now uh, with Carson's in, as in charge, but uh, I'd say leave it, it should be left open. And uh, it's like anything, why stifle uh, invention and innovation? So I'll add my, I agree with all that. And the only comment I would make is uh, I, There'll, there'll be a digital currency in the future. It may not be the ones that are being discussed today. You know, a number of the ones discussed today, Bitcoin, others, you know, sort of flunk the test of uh, price stability uh, and wide adoption. But the technology that has come with that, uh, uh, distributed ledgers and others, uh, other technologies, they'll be critical to a, a, a digital currency that does ultimately meet the standards and is adopted. I agree with John. I, I think innovation is inevitable and is uh, natural and probably a good thing. Okay, we have another live question from uh, William Pate. William, if you unmute, uh, you can ask your question. William? You need to unmute, William. You need to unmute? Hardest thing there is to do. <laughs> All right. Okay, I guess we lost him. Okay, we'll move on. Um, 
Where was, oh yes, uh, next question. Your thoughts on universal basic income? Well, there's a monetary policy question for you. <laughs> I think one. it's I think it's best to worry about incentives for people to to work and get education. And the extent that that uh, distorts those, I'm not uh, in favor of it. So I think it's we have the welfare system. I'm not saying it works well; it needs to be reformed. But I I would not go in that direction myself. Uh, next question: uh, Do you have any views or thoughts on the distributional effects of persistently low interest rates? Yeah, so I think this is something which uh, we probably need more research on. I think the there's been a danger of certain sectors benefiting from the low rates versus the high rates. And it's, it, it's uh, not necessarily a, always rich people or poor people or whatever, but I think the, I would say this, uh, if rates are gonna be zero forever, then that's gonna affect the income of people, savings for people. They're not gonna always be able to, to uh, save to, to get the reward that they should be having. So that worries me in terms of, of a distribution effect. I think that that wouldn't be the reason I would focus on it so much. I think the distribution issues are huge, by the way, in this country. I think that the coronavirus and COVID has, um, revealed a lot of income disparity that um, people knew about, didn't talk about it. Um, and I think we need to focus on that a lot. Part of it is education. Uh, part of it is just basic services. But I would say in terms of uh, income distribution, uh, the low rates, I think there's more important reasons to get those to a reasonable level than income distribution. And what we should do as much as we can is use other means. And to me, I'm, I'm in education business. So I see a huge disparity, uh, K-12 in the state of California and other places as well. So I, I hope we, we fix that part because believe me, this income distribution effect we're seeing right now is just, is just really terrible. Okay, we've uh, another audience member wants to ask a live question, Vance Skin. Uh, Vance, if you unmute, uh, you can ask your question. Hello, Dr. Taylor, how are, how are you? Good to, good to see you, Vance, except I can't see you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, thank you for the insights today. I was wondering about your thoughts on um, the Federal Reserve's actions to be better aligned with the natural rate of interest by imposing a fiscal rule along with a monetary policy rule. Um, is one of them more important than the other? And then, for example, if Congress ran less in deficits, wouldn't that help tame potential excesses by the Fed? I want to get your thoughts on that. That's a good question. Uh, so fiscal policy uh, has long interested me. I think in some sense, it's, it's maybe more difficult. Uh, it's not like we have an independent fiscal authority. There's lots of people weighing in in different directions. But I think if there was some uh, understanding about, you know, balanced budget and full employment and you have deficits and recessions and you have surpluses and booms, that would be good. I would like to see it go in that direction. I think it'd be better. And, and as I think you're, you're hinting, that will affect monetary policy because there are questions right now, and who knows what will happen in the future, about don't worry about the big deficits. The Fed is always there. And there's this theory, modern monetary theory, which uh, I think goes in that direction. It's not like nobody's paying attention to it. I don't agree with that, but uh, but it's out there, and you know who who knows about the future. We we could be uh, adversely affected by uh, on a monetary side by the by the high deficits. So it's something to, not to completely discount. Could I could I ask you, uh, Professor Taylor, one follow up? So uh, we we've obviously had uh, increasing political polarization over the last many years, right. to where people have commented that it's harder to get agreement on fiscal measures. Obviously in a crisis is a different matter, but fiscal measures and structural forms, you mentioned education, critical structural reform. And so because of that, maybe the central bank has tried to take too much, put too much responsibility on themselves because we just haven't had uh, an, a, an ability because of political polarization to get the fiscal and structural forms we needed. How, what would your comments be on, on that? I think it's very important for the central bank to maintain its independence and to have a somewhat limited focus. It can't do everything. 
Right. There, there are talks about environmental issues now, uh, central banks, and uh, the question about income distribution just came up. But I think the, the more uh, institutions like central banks can focus on inflation, on the, st on the stability of, of the overall economy, uh, keeping inflation uh, low, 2%, keeping unemployment close to the natural level, the, the better off we'd be. They can't do everything. And uh, I think the extent central banks try to do other things or try to go beyond their, um, their specifics, then it's dangerous. And I, I think what we, you know, we, we had a huge disagreement in the 70s about policy and, uh, and that, that, was, that was changed, uh, was, didn't disappear in the 80s, but policy, monetary policy become more, became more focused. Yeah. In this, in the midst of a very contentious debate about all kinds of policies, so I think it's it's fine, and and also I think that people understand that. And there, you're right though. There's a huge tendency. Well, we can't do this. We have to have the central bank do that. And but I think uh, it's it's important not to go in that direction. Central banks have a an awfully tough job the way it is now, describing what they can do and what they can't do. So that's what I would do as much as possible. It's a very important job. Uh, it's crucial to get right. So don't have many other responsibilities at the same time. All right, good, good advice. Uh, next question. Um, if you were advising Congress on its next package to support the economy, where would you target additional funding to keep the recovery from slipping? Well, I think this is where you have the, have the funds go to where it's really needed. Um, there's always a problem with stabilization packages or stimulus packages that they, they go out and they're not used effectively. In fact, I wrote about that in the, in the, in the 2007, 8, and 9 period. It's really amazing how much of that wasn't really part of the recovery. People debate it now, but I think that's the thing. So have it focused on the people who need it, the sectors that need it, and there are quite a few, rather than just have it more general. And then I would add to that, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if you could somehow make part of that where we're going. This is, not, the future is fiscal responsibility, or to even say that word these days. The future is to get back to a normal kind of policy. And that means dealing with the high growth of spending in certain, certain areas and have a debate about it. There will be debates about taxes, but, but all those things should be part of the question. We need to have a, a, a fiscal policy that is responsible and it's it's not too late to begin to think about that. I, I I believe it's not it's not clear it's going to happen in the next couple of weeks, but uh, it's very important to not to lose sight of that. And I think I think the, there aren't that many people talking about that. Quite frankly, uh, I think there should be more. Um, what are your thoughts on the uh, potential of the renminbi to displace the dollar as the world's reserve currency? I don't think it's uh, too realistic at this point. The rule of law is awfully important. Uh, the ability to invest your money without extra restrictions. So, but you know, I just mentioned the Chinese are thinking about cryptocurrencies, and and so uh, so don't be complacent. But it's uh, I've noticed just uh, on the side here. I've been very interested in the foreign policy things. Our relationship with China seems to be changing and their, their attitude is changing. So I think that makes the question more relevant uh, than it was a while ago. There may be some other things going on simply besides the economics. And I think there are, our foreign policy people need to be looking to that. But I think the dollar is very strong. We need to have good monetary policy that, that makes it strong. And I, I don't see why that's gonna change. Again, I'm, I'm more for rules rules-based policy, if we can somehow get back to that, I think we, we'd be better off. That's what's worked, that is what has worked in the past. And I think it's possible to do right now, and that would uh, preserve the role of the dollar going forward. So let me just follow up, given we mentioned RMB and China. Uh, I know you spent a lot of time on trade and your role as uh, Under Secretary of International Finance. What, what, what's, your, what's your take, your reaction to the, the tensions we've had over the last several years particularly trade tensions with China? So I think what's, what's important is to make sure that our overall objective of lower barriers is, is there. What has happened, I think, is China has been, um, for, for good reason, pointed out as very high barriers, 
have very high uh, impediments. And so it's hard to use the usual in the trade negotiations when mm -hmm. one side is very high and one side is very low. And so that has caused us asymmetry. But I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we'd be better off with lower barriers around. And uh, sometimes that happens because not everybody wants lower barriers. And I think the dialogue has changed a little bit, but it worries me that uh, we're losing sight of the ultimate goal, which is really free trade, let's face it. That would be, we'd be better off. But in the meantime, you've got this imbalance of, of uh, restrictions and it's hard to use a usual trade negotiation in that circumstance. So we're into these very unusual kinds of discussions, but keep them in, 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 in train. So I gather take from your comments, you'd rather not use imposing tariffs as a remedy to try to level the playing field, or you'd be careful about that. Be very careful. I would, it, it's, uh, it's the trade war uh, potential is great. And uh, it's hard to control sometimes once it's, once it's going, but no, I think the, you know, the U S has been uh, a leader for many years in uh, trade and free markets and, promotion of that. I think we shouldn't get off of that. Uh, it's, it's been a great value to the international system. So I think it's in, in the, the, the trends are not uh, that great now in that respect. So <laughs> this is maybe pushing, pushing uphill a big stone. We'll, we'll see. Okay, uh, I got a couple of questions on this. What would be problematic about going back to the gold standard? Uh, there's a little question. So let me say, I, I have uh, sympathies with the gold standard in the sense it's a rules-based system. Yeah. You, uh, you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, but I think it's, um, it's, it's too restrictive and not realistic, in fact. And you can argue that these ideas for rules, Taylor or whatever you want to think is, in a way, it's a more flexible, more realistic way to have, you have a, you have a, a target for inflation, you know, the target uh, for gold, it makes sense. It's a broad-based target. It's not just one, one commodity. But it, the notion is saying you want price stability and that's good. And you have a relatively limited role, the central bank to deliver that. Uh, and unemployment is, is part of that. But I think it's in a way, I'm sympathetic with the notion of a rule, but I think there's much better rules that we could have. Uh Moving forward, how worried are you about our lack of policy space, I guess, on the fiscal side? Lack of policy space. I need more clarification. Sorry. Uh, I'm guessing it's, you know, by piling on debt today, it limits our ability to deal with a comparably sized crisis in the future. Uh, well, that's, that's the, the question, question is, if your debt is, if you've got 100% debt to GDP yeah. ratio, there's not, not much you can do. Yeah, it's, it's an issue. I think there's many reasons to be concerned about the debt being too high. There's just general crowding out, there's things like that. So yeah, I'd add, I'd add that to the list, although it's not high on my list right now. It's, it's something to think about. I don't know, do you agree with that, Rob? You... Yeah, I do agree with it. I, and I think this explains why, uh, or amplifies why, in, in, not in the middle of a crisis, but as we get beyond the crisis, it, to the extent we can, taking steps to quote unquote normalize monetary policy, taking steps to moderate our debt growth in the out years, all that will give us more uh, bandwidth la uh, space as a yeah. questioner asked to deal with future issues. And I, I do think that's important. I agree with that. And I guess we're, we're, we're running up in time, Mark. Or how we we're, yeah, we've got about a minute left. Um, I guess this is something we kind of talked about uh, in the, in, before that we went live, work from home. You think that's going to be a permanent shift? Uh, you know, of all, many, all these changes we've seen over the past yeah. six months, how many are going to persist? In many respects, I think there's some permanence to this. I think we're we're used to uh, working in different locations. Uh, it's it's affecting people's lifestyle. It's not going to be exactly Zoom, Zoom, Zoom all the time for sure. But you know, one of the firms out here, Facebook, says they're going to be half half working away. I think it mm -hmm. may be. More than that, when you get through it, you go to the parking lots and everybody's empty, somehow they're functioning. Uh, we're using Zoom and our classes, 350 students all over the world taking my course. It won't be exactly the same, but it'll be different. And I'm convinced of that. And I think it's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be different for the better, I hope. 
So, John, let, let me just ask you a question in closing. Uh, you've been a leader in, uh, in the education sector, uh, in academia, in the public sector. Uh, you believe in public service. We've got a big audience tonight. Uh, you've got uh, CEOs, mayors, citizens. And the one thing they probably have in common, the fact they're tuning in from wherever they are is they care about the economy and they care about the country. What advice would you give to uh, people in the audience about how they can contribute, what they can do personally to help better the country, participate in public service, ways they can make their community better? So I think first of all, like you, I'm kind of disturbed by this uh, huge disagreement we have there for reasons that seem to be inexplicable. So I think the the analysis, you know, what's what's the right tax policy? What's the right economic policy? I think there's huge ag agreement about how we should discuss this. Not agreement on the results, but but sensible discussion. I, I would say try to encourage that and don't get torn apart by the what seem to be petty kind of partisan disagreements. The other thing which um, I think maybe personally, if you if you could have a way to go back and forth and if you're in business, you know, maybe take a leave or do something different for a while or in between jobs, because I think there's so much to on both sides, uh, whether it's academia or private sector, public sector, that, that you can learn from that. So I think if you just stay in one the whole time, which of course many people do, it's uh, it's not that great. I mean, you yourself, Rob, have, have chosen to take different different uh, types of professions, and I think that's I think that's something that be should be emphasized. It's actually very American. You know, many countries uh, I'm dealing with uh, public officials in various jobs. Frequently, they're in that job all the time. They're in the in the Ministry of Finance forever. But we have a back and forth more, you know, more than other places, and I think that's good. It's part of part of the system in the U.S. And I, I, you know, I'd like to continue with that. You know, citizen soldiers, whatever it happens to be, very important part. So I would I would emphasize that too. All right, John. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your leadership, and we look forward to having you back regularly in the years to come at the Dallas Fed. But we uh, really appreciate the conversation tonight with you. Thank you so much. Thank you too, Mark. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. Apologies if you submitted a question that we did not get to. Uh, you'll soon receive a survey asking for feedback on this event and we'd very much welcome your candid responses. We hope you will be able to join us for some of our upcoming Global Perspectives events, which will feature former Bank of England Governor Mark Carney and former Texas Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, Joe Strauss. Details on how to register for these events can be found at dallasfed.org. And with that, we are adjourned. Have a good evening.